problems that even a middle-aged man has to sweat when grappling with. And no question in his work is greater and more pregnant than the question of the ring's corrupting power, and why Gandalf or Elrond doesn't just set himself up as the anti-Sauron, an FDR or Churchill to Sauron's Hitler. With Stalin as Saruman? Tolkien, of course, always denied that his epic was an allegory. But you gotta wonder. When Richard Hanania, who had long since stopped being Richard Hoste, who had even gotten laid, realized that the combination of his talent and his credentials could be compelling to more than just the readers of Countercurrents, he felt what Bilbo felt when he found the Ring of Gigas. He felt the power to matter. He realized that if his substack posts were compelling enough, if his foundation got enough media hits, he could even influence policy he could maybe drive legislation he might even bend the ear of Paul Ryan. Hanania likes to cite Robert Trivers' work on motivated cognition and self-deception. Physician, heal thyself. Motivated cognition is a terrible end for a true philosopher. Especially now, Richard Hanania will never, ever speak to Paul Ryan. Not that Paul Ryan even still matters. Not that, as anything like a statesman, as if any such thing existed in our benighted age, Hanania, for all his errors, is far beyond Paul Ryan. But. What should a philosopher do? What should a shoemaker do? A shoemaker should make shoes. Fortunately, the world is not run by shoemakers. Shoemakers have never found the ring of power. Shoemakers do not become more important if they can get men to wear long pointy shoes. So the shoemaker has one job, to make good shoes at a good price. And men's feet do not look like carrots and they do not trip over their toes. In my view, a philosopher should make philosophy. He should be sincere. He should tell the truth as he sees it. He should not be a troll. He should not be a shill. Trolls are cucks, in a backward way. Shills are just cucks. A politician, like Paul Ryan, does not have opinions, he has positions. A philosopher, like Richard Hanania should be, does not have positions, he has opinions. But a respected public intellectual. When I started writing on the internet 15 years ago, I had no audience and no impact. No one cared what I thought and I liked it that way. All I had was opinions. Now I have an audience, but I still try to just have opinions. I am not a respected public intellectual and I will never be one, inshallah. And my takes are always sincere. Why else would I be praising Leon de Grel? Am I being bribed with secret Nazi gold? Yet I do live in the real world. But I have noticed that in the real world, the nominal impact of bending Paul Ryan's ear, or whatever, which is the sad currency of the respected public intellectual, is fool's gold. Everyone takes it seriously and pretends it is real. Sometimes, rarely, it is slightly real. Generally everyone just pretends, and the pyrite vanishes in a bookseller's season. Who reads the respected public intellectuals of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s? No, the philosopher who wants a real impact should be. A philosopher. Often he will go entirely unread in his time, often he will have to wait not until he is discovered, but until he is rediscovered. A prophet has no honor in his own country. But then his impact will not be a trickle, but a tsunami, and his descendants, if their copyright survives, will have the royalty stream of a Marx, a Rand, a Plato. He will be dead, but in his life, he will have his honor. Try it, Richard. You really are better than this. Are you actually a classical liberal? I ask because, in your apology, you segue directly from. The more I looked at the data, the more I became convinced that liberalism simply worked. Steve Pinker's books of the last decade are irrefutable on this point. Nonetheless, many pundits and intellectuals continue to argue that what we need is not sensible reform, for example, what I argue should be done with civil rights law, but an overthrowing of the entire system and a move to a new post-liberal order. I'm convinced that most of them are just projecting their personal unhappiness onto the rest of the world, just as I once did. 2. If the worry is that migrants might vote for socialism or commit crimes, then the answer is not to exclude people from society or otherwise discriminate against them based on group averages, but to attack socialism and crime directly. The Bukele miracle saw an order of magnitude drop in the murder rate in El Salvador within a few years, and it did not involve changing the demographics of the country. No. But it did not involve classical liberalism, either. In fact, the Bukele miracle involved a complete overthrow of the entire system of classical liberalism, of jurisprudential protection of human rights. It even involved arresting journalists. A to me. Classical liberalism, it turned out, was the primary mutation that gave El Salvador a murder rate near 100 per 100,000. Cancel it with the stroke of a pen, and the nation's cancer is cured. Bukele should get the Nobel. Pinker has simply oversampled weirdness. Liberalism simply works in Iceland. Anything would work in, 
21st century, Iceland. Iceland is roughly as hard to govern as Burning Man. It is not only post-political, it is post-human. Nietzsche's last man is a natural libertarian and needs no government at all, just condoms, seed oils and weed. But in the rest of the world, the world that is still human, normal human politics still operates, and Aristotle has not been superseded by Steven Pinker. In the rest of the world, which we call the third world, the replacement of proliberal political philosophy with liberal political philosophy has a name. We call it decolonialization. When we count the violent deaths that we can attribute to this process, start with the partition of India, and work forward, we soon surpass the Holocaust. If we broaden it to encompass all the applications of Western political philosophy to previously non-liberal societies, thus folding in the whole black book of communism we are easily in nine figures of accelerated human mortality. Moreover, look at the third world today. While the revolutionary period of the 20th century has largely burned out, vast swaths of the globe, lacking the lucky genius of a Bukele or a Kagame, are mired in chaotic, corrupt, incompetent government. Seventy years ago, Time magazine called the Belgian Congo a tropical cornucopia. The Belgians compare the Congo with the state of Texas, though in fact the Congo is bigger and far richer in its natural resources. The Congo's gross national product has tripled since 1939. Money is plentiful. Belgian investors take more than $50 million a year in dividends alone. Once the Congo depended exclusively on mining and farming, today it manufactures ships, shoes, cigarettes, chemicals, explosives and photographic film. With its immense reserves of hydroelectric power, a fifth of the world's total, the Belgians expect the Congo to become the processing plant for all Africa. Look at it now. What substance was added to the petri dish, but the magic elixir of Dr. Pinker? Our virologists did a better job of stopping bat coronaviruses, than our liberal political scientists at bringing peace, order and human rights. Does anyone have eyes? Today, there is no better ongoing natural experiment in the combination of normal, non-weird human populations with a classical liberal, British-derived system of government, than the beautiful rainbow nation of South Africa. Richard, I encourage you to read the memoir of liberal Afrikaner André de Reuter, who for three years had the misfortune of being the CEO of ESCOM, South Africa's electricity company. You'll see why the power is out eight hours a day. You talk about migrants without considering the legacy systems, old 20th century laws that no one really believes in anymore, that hold back the real pressures of human migration. As you know, Richard, being a classical liberal, no person is illegal. Your human rights as a person do not depend on the GPS coordinates at which your mother squeezed you out. How could they? Isn't this just a blatant proxy for racism? How repulsive. By 2050, there will be 2 billion Africans. What percentage of these people would make the rational decision to exercise their human right to move to North America? 25% seems low. What does it actually cost to transport a human being across the Atlantic? What would be the container ship fare for this new middle passage? Breathes there an African so broke that he can't afford a couple hundred bucks to move to paradise? Imagine the country you now live in. Add 500 million African immigrants, and you will see why South Africa in the 2020s looks like a piece of the future that fell into the present, your future, Richard, and mine. And our children's. What's especially hilarious is that the founding prophet of true 19th century classical liberalism, none other than John Stuart Mill, understood this perfectly. As he wrote, I myself always have been for a good stout despotism, for governing Ireland like India. John Stuart Mill, repulsive? Fascist? Racist? Richard, please comment. How did Mill go so wrong? How, as a classical liberal, do you attack socialism and crime not just in Iceland or Vermont, but in Louisiana or South Africa? How, as a data-driven social scientist, considering the result of the last 30 years, would you have voted in the last a liberal election in South Africa, in 1994? Do you actually expect your therapies to work? As a monarchist, I have an easy solution to the question of government. People always admit that the best government is a good king, then ask how we will get a good king. The answer is easy, we should replace our current oligarchy with Frederick the Great. Then these people ask me how we can reanimate Frederick the Great. I admit that this is a research problem. Modern medicine has made great strides, however. Maybe he can be cloned from dirt in his tomb? Maybe something something AI? Our respectable public intellectuals love to propose solutions that rely on similar levels of magical thinking. To wit, Hananiya. An anti-wokeness agenda would involve, at the very least. 1. Eliminating disparate impact, making the law require evidence of intentional discrimination. 2. Getting rid of the concept of hostile work environment, 
or defining it in extremely narrow and explicit terms, making sure that it does not restrict political or religious speech. 3. Repealing the executive orders that created and expanded affirmative action among government contractors and the federal workforce. One reason to be optimistic is that much of this work can be done without having to pass laws, which is almost impossible to do on controversial issues in the current environment, but through the executive branch and the courts. Through the courts. In fact, the concept of disparate impact does not exist in civil rights law, nor does affirmative action. These laws are entirely colorblind. The legislators who wrote them were perfectly clear. Senator Hubert Humphrey said that the bill would prohibit preferential treatment for any particular group, and then promised that if the bill had any language which provides that the employer will have to hire on the basis of a percentage or quota related to quotas. I will start eating the pages. Quotas happened. American Race Communism, ARC, was justified, through the courts. On the basis of diversity. Senator Humphrey kept eating his steaks. Moreover, the enormous generational political effort required to put six Republican justices on the Supreme Court has had zero effect. Race quotas in college admissions will remain, as they remain in California, which has banned them. The court has just required colleges to stop asking students about their race. So the students have to tell. We have merely added another layer of mendacity and hypocrisy to the septic tank. By treating the law and the courts as automatic and impartial machines above sovereignty and power, Hanania is betraying the uselessness of his political science PhD. Has he even read the Italian school? He is asking his gullible readers to labor long and bring forth another mouse, by passing a new law which declares that the old law means what it has already said for the last 60 years. And why have the Republican justices, after such long labor, delivered no more than a slap on the wrist to American race communism? After saying such clear and true and encouraging things, like the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race? Surely when the Chief Justice of the United States, in his August black robe, tells us that 2 plus 2 equals 4, we can all hold up. Four fingers? Au contraire. The Chief Justice of the United States is not stupid. He knows that there is no way to end race communism with a court order. The fact that it took over the country, the public sector and the private sector, federal, state, local and corporate, not only without any legal approval, but directly in contradiction to civil rights law, which not only is colorblind, but requires colorblindness, tells us that no law and no court order has the power to defeat this terrible force. From a political science perspective, the most important decision in the history of America is Dred Scott, because Dred Scott established that courts are not above power. The goal of the Dred Scott majority was frankly political, to prevent the civil war by stopping the anti-slavery movement. Narrator, it didn't work. As Stalin said, how many divisions does the Pope have? Even when Republicans control the Supreme Court, there is no way for them to punish lower courts. They can only issue a decision at a time. Masterpiece Cake Shop's owner, even after winning his glorious 7-2 victory, is still being litigated into oblivion. The Supreme Court can unleash the power of a movement with the will and force to rule. Civil rights law, which was written to confirm a uniformly colorblind America, could unleash the power of race communism. No law and no court has a thousandth of the power it would take to put this regime back in the box. Chief Justice Roberts, a crafty and realistic fellow, understands this perfectly. He might want to end race communism, but he really doesn't want to try to do it and fail, and the harder he tries, the worse he will look. So much for sensible reform. How can we imagine this sensible reform being implemented? Sweet friends, please do not quote me out of context. I am not proposing this, but reducing it to absurdity. Let us imagine ending wokeness in the wrong way, which would still not work, but would work better than anything Hanania or Rufo can imagine. We would take a tip from the Canadians or for that matter, the Coloradans and set up a parallel system of kangaroo courts. These organizations would be staffed by fanatical classical liberals, or, since there is inherently no such thing as a fanatical classical liberal, just fanatical Christian racists, if enough of these can still be found, or men's rights activists, or all of the above, this would be an intersectional fascism or just straight-up white supremacy, or something. These Sundergerichten would be empowered to fine any company, school, or agency practicing race-based hiring, admissions, etc., as an administrative punishment reviewable, of course, by the courts. Does this feel retarded? Of course it feels retarded, because it is still using oligarchic methods to defeat oligarchy. It would probably still fail. Oligarchies want to oligarchy. The classical liberals, or racists, or whoever, would lack the energy and devotion of their Prague enemies. Sooner or later they would get owned, and the kangaroo courts would turn into just what they are now.
No reform is possible, even retarded reform. I prefer Roberts to Hanania, Chris Rufo, and the rest of this new generation of pundits who imagine that a new oligarchy can displace an old oligarchy. Roberts at least knows he is a grifter, or, at least, knows his decisions are purely symbolic. Perhaps he hopes that this symbolism will produce some kind of intellectual leadership around which some new power will coalesce, but he knows he does not have the power to really act. This makes him useless, but at least not dangerous.